Good morning, everybody. This is Tim Gleisner from the Library of Michigan, Head of Collections. Today, speaking with Linda Solomon, photojournalist and the author of The Queen Next Door, a photo journey with uh, Aretha Franklin. So today, uh, in this continuing segment with the Michigan Notable Books Program, if you wish to support the program, you can contact the Library of Michigan Foundation, either found at the beginning, or contact information either found at the beginning of this segment or at the end of this segment. And with that, I'd like to welcome Linda Solomons. Linda, how are you today? I'm good, Tim. It's great to be with you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Great to be with you. And I just wanted to say to everybody, as I always say with opening remarks about why this book was chosen, first of all, if you haven't seen The Queen Next Door by Wayne State University Press, this is a beautiful book. It's a beautiful photo journey uh, taken of some intimate moments with the Queen of Soul from Detroit, a uh, hometown woman from Detroit, uh, Aretha Franklin. Beautiful book. We knew as soon as we saw it that this was going to be a very strong contender for the Michigan Notable Books Program. And so with that, um, Linda, it's very nice to have you here today. And I wonder, I'm just wondering if you could give us some background on yourself, how you became a photographer slash writer. How did that all start for you? And, and, <laughs> and, and what led you up to this point? Well, it all started uh, when I was a child. I was given a camera at the age of five. And I was the one in the family always taking all the photographs. And, you know, I learned early on, it was just a wonderful way to just capture things forever to be able to express feelings. And uh, it was just, what can I say? The camera became my friend at a very young age. But it was another gift that changed my life forever. When I was 13, my parents had given me a beautiful gift. It was a, a beautiful book that was embossed with my name. Mm -hmm. And when I opened it up, it was a photographic album. And that was the gift that truly changed my life because it showed how my parents were proud of my photographs. Wow. And it was a very sophisticated album for a 13 year old. And I still have it. In fact, I could probably show it to you. It's right in my library. Okay. And it has the photos captured when I was a child. And, but again, uh, my parents just encouraged me to always take photographs. They, you know, let me continue to grow with my hobby that became my passion, my profession. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, you had to wait a week before you could see your photographs, you know, shooting film and right. take you to the drugstore. And I, I can still remember, you know, always, you know, waiting in line at the drugstore, asking if my film had been returned and I could see my photographs. It was always exciting. And I think I, I, felt that same excitement when I became, you know, a newspaper columnist and I would open the paper and see the photos published. And, and that's how I met Aretha. I was a columnist with the Detroit News in the 80s. Okay. And she was just coming back to Detroit. And I had always wanted to meet her and photograph her. You know, growing up in Detroit, you know, I had the opportunities to see some of the Motown stars as a kid. And I had photos of, of Diana Ross and the Supremes and the Four Tops that I had taken as a child. But I never had the opportunity to meet Aretha. Right. She had moved early on to New York and Los Angeles and yeah, yeah. came back to Detroit, you know, in the early 80s. And that's how I was able to meet her, by asking to do a story on her for my Detroit News column. So I have to ask, when you talk about you took pictures of the Motown stars when you were a child, and I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with Motown, always have been, and my mom was an avid listener of Motown when I was a kid, and I always danced to it. Uh, How did you capture, I mean, were you at concerts that you saw Diana Ross, or did, was it on Well, the you know, when we were kids, the yeah. Supremes and the Four Tops, the Temptations, would sign their records. So you could go to record stores in downtown Detroit and wait in line, as I did. And also you could go to the State Fair. And oh. it was wonderful to be able to go to the State Fair every summer and see all of our favorite celebrities in concert. And I always had my camera. And back then they didn't question you, you know, you could always bring a camera. <laughs> so I have loads of photos taken, you know, as a child of the great Motown stars, but it was always a dream for me to meet Aretha. And I had heard a promo that she was going to be on 
a local talk show, Kelly and Company. And I called the producer and I said, I'd love to come down and, and introduce myself to Aretha and hopefully do a story. And I waited for her outside of Broadcast House at Channel 7. And as she pulled up in her limousine, I was standing there. And I said, Miss Franklin, I, I am such a huge fan. And I'm a columnist with the Detroit News. And I'd love to take a few photos of you and to talk to you for a few minutes. Would that be OK? Sure. And she said, yes. And then I said, may I take a photo of you outside the station? And, and she said, yes. And then as we were walking in, as all photographers always do, ask, can I take a few more? And she said, of course. So the photos that I had first captured are in the book. Right. And it was a magical morning for me because Aretha played piano, you know, in front of an audience of about 75 people. Wow. And, and there was nothing more special than seeing Aretha accompany herself. So during that first meeting, I was able to meet her and photograph her singing at the piano. And I did a story for my column in the Detroit News. And she called me. Can you imagine, Tim? Oh, no. It was uh, one of those, you know, old fashioned peak slips left for me. Aretha Franklin called you. And actually, her name was misspelled, <laughs> whoever had taken the message. <laughs> but I saved that pink slip. I have it. And I called her and she invited me to a private event at Mary Young's residence. And that was a turning point for me because at that event, I was able to meet her entire family. Wow. And I met her brother, Reverend Cecil Franklin, who was her manager and her nieces and her sisters. And it really was special because I was able to introduce myself and Cecil invited me to so many incredible experiences with Aretha, but it was all because of that second meeting that, you know, we had the chance to really get to know one another. I did another story about her and I had so many exclusive stories on her in the Detroit news. You know, she was one of the most private celebrities. So for her to give me that kind of access was so special and, and, and really unique. So I got to ask, so now my mind is reeling with questions. <laughs> I had all these list of questions and they're all gone. Sure. So, first of all, what was your column about? What were you doing with this column? <laughs> what were you documenting at that time? Well, I had a couple of different columns, but that one was called Star Tracks. And I would photograph and interview a celebrity coming to Detroit, in Detroit. Had to, everything had to be in person. You know, no, nothing could be on the phone. Right. And so the column included one photograph and brief copy. And then I did an at-home series and another series called Click. But that one uh, was really just a, a brief interview, but very upbeat and sure. shared stories about celebrities visiting Detroit. Okay. And so then the other question I have, and you make mention of this in the book, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, her family was very <laughs> influential in the city of Detroit yeah. and in the surrounding area. Can you describe her family? I mean, you got entree into this. Mm -hmm. the first families of the city of Detroit. What was it like? And, and I mean, were they all welcoming? I mean, what, what was that? What was that? Like? That's, a, that's a wonderful question. And I think that is really the key to our relationship. And I'll explain that. You, with Aretha, family was everything to her. And her family was absolutely terrific. Her sisters, Irma and Carolyn, her brother, Reverend Cecil, her sister-in-law, Erlene, her nieces, uh, Crystal and Sabrina, and Sabrina has written me afterward to my book. Mm -hmm. But getting to know them was so welcoming for me. They made me feel like I was part of the family. They truly did. And, and I always included her family in the photographs. So that was the key. I never once said, Aretha, let me take a photo of you and then ignore the family. I never would do that. I've seen that happen so many times with celebrities, you know, covering celebrities for as many years as I've covered celebrities, where you see photographers almost push aside the family just to photograph the star. And it's really insulting and actually quite hurtful to yeah. the members of the family and to the celebrity. But 
I just adored her family. So it was very natural for me to say, Aretha, I'd love to take a photo of you in your hallway to your bedroom where all your gold records are displayed. But may I take the photo of you and Irma, her, her sister? And she said, yes. And she would smile and Irma, you know, they loved just being together. And I was able to capture their relationship, but also include them mm -hmm. in as many photographs, you know, as I possibly could, because they were so wonderful and they meant so much to Aretha and they meant so much to me. I mean, they were, they were so great to me. And so it was just a very natural thing for me to want to include them, you know, in everything she did because she included them in everything she did. Aretha never went anywhere without her family. And so as a journalist in documenting Aretha Franklin, it, it's only accurate to capture her with her beautiful family whom she adored and loved and respected. Mm. And I respected them as much as I respected her. Nice. So let me ask you a question. So these photos obviously take place over two decades, if I'm not, maybe even three decades, if I'm not. Yeah, mistaken. four decades. <laughs> oh, yeah, I apologize. So, um, how long i mean like how long would a typical photo shoot be with aretha and her family or just you know the one that stood out to me just because i'm a fan of them too the, the photos with the rolling stones like how long was it a whole day that you would be with these photos? Not really no that's not my style i okay. think that was the other key to our relationship i would only take a few photographs and that would be it you know today with digital photography you see photographers taking hundreds of photos that's not the way i work uh i always take just when i need and then I move on and I would give her her space. I never was intrusive. You know, so in planning the book, I would look back at my contact sheets because the majority of the images were shot on film. I would look back and think, oh, gee, why didn't I take just a few more? But that wouldn't have been the way I captured her because I always would just take a few and then let her enjoy her Christmas parties, her birthday parties, because she included me in all of those very personal experiences and i didn't want to always be in her face and i think that's what she liked about my style i would do a column about it but i was never there to just intrude upon her privacy and her fun so describe that so that part also intrigues me so when you say for your columns so was she constantly inviting you back to these uh constantly she and her brother Cecil, who really managed, you know, everything she did. Right. And he would always include me, you know, in all of these private events. For example, when she did the iconic concert with James Brown, yeah. I was the only photographer asked to capture the rehearsal. And that was downtown in Detroit, a club taboo. And Aretha was in her red leather jeans and her tennies with her script, no makeup. And she, was fine with me taking photos she never once asked for photo approval which i think is very interesting tim because so many celebrities today you know make you jump through hoops i'll give you an example of that with lady gaga but not aretha i mean one of the greatest superstars of all time when she trusted you she trusted you and that was it and so i photographed her often during rehearsals during her first concert with the detroit symphony I was with her on stage, at, with her. I mean, right there next to her. She had no makeup on. Wow. And I did a, a photo essay on her for CNN. But she knew that that was the way, you know, it should be documented. That's the way she rehearsed, no makeup. And she trusted me. And, and I will always respect that about her. Also, see, a book like this, yeah. this kind of documentation really couldn't happen again. And I'll explain that. See, today with celebrities, everybody's got their cell phone. Everybody's already put the photos on Instagram or on Facebook even before the event is over. But with these experiences with Aretha, her private parties, her Christmas parties, her backstage rehearsals, her accepting the AMA awards, there wasn't anyone there with a cell phone. It was just me and a camera. And so today, you know, with celebrities, it would be boring because we've already seen it. These are images you have not seen, or if they, you've seen them, they, one or two, of course, were published in my column or, on tele, or used on television. But with that said, 
today, you know, th this kind of book, no, it can't happen. I mean, the celebrities themselves have already posted everything. So, you know, with that said, um, you know, at those parties, you know, no one had a camera. I mean, it, they were private parties of hers and, you know, they were just experiences that I was so very fortunate to be able to have in my life and also to document. Well, you said something very interesting. I'd like you to follow up on it. So you said photo approval. Now I have a basic idea of what that might entail, but I've never <laughs> actually heard that term before. So what does that entail with a star, say like Lady Gaga or anybody else of today? Well, it can be a nightmare and I'll, I'll explain that. Um, I was, you know, really there to photograph Tony Bennett, but, but Lady Gaga was performing with him. Right. And Tony Bennett a, is a very close friend of mine. And I've documented him for years and I've done stories for Good Morning America on Tony Bennett as both a, a, an artist, as a painter, and of course, his incredible career as a singer. Mm -hmm. So when he was coming to Meadowbrook, he said, Linda, I feel really badly, but everything has to go through Lady Gaga's office. <laughs> and, and, you know, she, there were so many things that I had to sign away, Tim. I mean, they sent me this whole list of things. And I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I am not going through this. And, and I didn't. I mean, it was ridiculous. And then when I got there, we went backstage. Yeah. Uh, Tony had invited us. And she had a photographer there, you know, taking a photo, you know, with Tony and with his friends. And, of course, she was included. And I remember thinking she made me jump through hoops, you know. And, and yet, you know, they sent these photos to us or whatever. And, and the lighting was the worst lighting I've ever seen. So I thought, here, here she made someone like me, you know, who was very sensitive to lighting. And then she had someone there who was taking photos and the lighting was extremely unflattering. In fact, I, I've never shown the photo to anyone. <laughs> And it's with Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett and my mother. But with that said, I think that the sensitivity one has, I mean, I am extremely sensitive and I understand, you know, the power of natural light. So with Aretha, you know, everything in the book, you know, is natural light. And I, you know, the cover of the book was taken when she's looking out the window in the hallway of her home. And it's just all natural. I, I don't use anything artificial unless it's stage light that she has created or lighting, you know, that was existing lighting. But as a journalist, I don't alter. Everything is natural. Can I show the cover? Sure. And then I want to talk about the title because I love the title because it really, in my mind, describes the ethos of, or ethos of, uh, of Aretha Franklin. What was the significance of that title? Well, the title is based on her own quote, a very famous quote of hers. Oh, really? And she has often said, you know, I am the lady next door when I'm not on stage. So that's really why the title was selected. But also the photograph was taken at her masquerade ball and she was Queen Nefertiti. <laughs> and I'll never forget seeing her with that wonderful costume and she looked as regal as ever. And see, Aretha could be both regal and then very down to earth. So I mentioned in the book how I would often see her at Kroger's. So yeah. when you talk about the lady next door, she did her own grocery shopping. And I was in Kroger and I said to the cashier, I said, you know, Aretha Franklin is in the produce aisle. And she said to me, she's always here. <laughs> so Aretha was always at Kroger. Everyone has an Aretha story, Tim. You know, it's very funny. I, the only comparison that I can make regarding the wonderful anecdotes and stories that Detroiters have about Aretha yeah. is that it's very similar to uh, the Elvis relationship in Memphis. Every Memphian has an Elvis story. Right, you right. Know? And I've been to Memphis many times and they'll all tell you, oh, yes, you know, my aunt was Elvis's teacher. Oh, yes, my brother once met Elvis here you know so it's so cute and I think we are very similar in the regard to our queen uh, Aretha I mean everybody has a great Aretha story seeing her either at Kroger's I mean Governor Blanchard told me he had 
bumped into Aretha at the Save On Drugstore on Telegraph and Maple. Really? <laughs> and he said, there's our queen. And Aretha looked at him and she said, and there's our governor. <laughs> nice. So I got to ask, I mean, like, that's something that I always admired about her. I mean, she's one of the stars that really, I mean, she just embraced her hometown. And from what you're saying, they embraced her. I mean, how important, how important was Detroit? I mean, how important was Detroit throughout this book, do you think? I, I only Well, have... Detroit is woven in the fabric of the book in every sense of that word. Yeah. I mean, it's published by a Detroit publisher, which I felt Aretha would want. Sure. And Detroit, I mean, everything is based in Detroit. I mean, there are a few events in the book that were not in Detroit, but so few. I mean, I would say 95% of the book is about Aretha at home, whether it was, you know, in concert at home, whether it was in rehearsal at home, whether it was in a video, a music video with the Rolling Stones, they came to Detroit. You know, and I want to discuss that during the 80s, Aretha brought the music industry back. You know, once Motown had left, that was, you know, devastating. But Aretha brought it back because she had everyone come to Detroit to either do a music video or a concert or a special. Right. Everyone came to Detroit. So she single-handedly brought the music industry back in the 80s when she had those great years with Who's Zooming Who and all Jumping Jack Flash and all of the the hits that she had during the 80s. Right. She didn't travel then. She was not even going on the road, even as far away as Cleveland. I mean, she everything she did was in Detroit during that brief period in the 80s. Then she started to travel again, you know, on her bus. And then she traveled extensively, of course, in the 90s and the year 2000 and, and forward. So, but it was those... Years in the 80s during the Who's Zooming Who freeway years that she did not travel at all. Wow. So let me ask you, so mm -hmm. what gave you the idea to create this book? Was this something that you'd been sitting on for a while, that you'd been talking to people about? What, what would finally prompted the, the, the making of this book? Well, I never, you know, I wanted her to live forever, so I never thought of doing a book. Um, but when she passed away, I was asked by the family to be the photographer at her memorial. Wow. And that was really emotional for me. And uh, then Sabrina had, you know, asked me to provide photographs for that memorial book that was given out to everyone at her memorial. And I started looking back and I thought, you know, in order for me to really share my love, my respect, I really should do a tribute to her because I have all of these photographs that maybe people have not seen. I mean, as I said, many were published years ago in the Detroit News, but I thought this really shows her in a way that people will, will just respect because it shows her feeling, you know, philanthropic heart. I mean, she gave so much back to Detroit. There's a segment in the book where you even see her answering the telephone, yes. taking pledges at an Easter At the PBS, program. yes, I saw that. That was amazing. Can you, um, can you imagine him making a pledge and hearing that voice? No. But she was so philanthropic in her hometown. And I thought, people need to see this. Yeah. People need to always understand the queen and also the lady next door. So it was my way of, of, of really showing my love and respect. And, and I think these everlasting tributes like my book, the film that's, that'll be coming out on Martin Luther King Day uh, with Jennifer Hudson. These are the tributes that need to continue forever for our queen. You know, in today's world, you know, it's such, it, it's so, well, what can I say? You know, the younger generations really only know about the stars that they see in their social media. Right. So it's very important that we continue to share Aretha Franklin with future generations by doing tributes, as I've mentioned. Okay, so let me ask, I mean, you obviously had many, many photographs. Uh, what, what made you choose the photographs that went into this book? Well, I had a great editor at, the, at Wayne State University Press who really made that final decision because there were many, many more, as you just mentioned. Sure. And Annie Martin is a terrific editor. So she was able to just 
put it in the form that needed that it needed to be in, and she did a fabulous job. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed her her view of my work and what she felt would really capture both the queen next door, I mean, the lady next door, and of course, the queen of soul. So the chronological look, because really the photographs, if I remember correctly, come in different years as you're taking. Yes. That was all Miss Martin then? It was. Okay. She, she was really the one that encouraged me to share more of my feelings. You know, I've always been one to just, uh, you know, I think share the photograph. But she said, Linda, I think people want to hear what it was like. And she really brought that out in me. And she kept saying, tell us more, tell us more. And, and, and I did, because I, I was sort of reluctant to do that. And it, it allowed me to kind of go back in my own history with her. And I will tell you what I learned, Tim, and I think it's very important yeah. uh, for everyone to really not just share photographs, but print them. Because when I went back and I looked at the photos of Aretha, I had forgotten a lot of things. And, it, and I realized that the photographs allowed me to remember some of the most special things that I probably would not have recalled if I, if I didn't have the photo. So I feel that photographs really become our history, our memory. And it's very important to print. You know, often we don't do that today. And if something is lost, it's lost forever. So, you know, I was so grateful that I had my negatives, my photographs, that I could reflect back on those wonderful years when I first met Aretha and all of the experiences that she invited me to capture in her life. So I got to ask about that process because you you were a columnist for the Detroit News. Yeah. You were marrying words and photos together a long time ago, but I mean, how hard is that process to look at a photo and to adequately describe? I mean, you were talking about the editor was saying, give us more, give us more. <laughs> I mean, I got to imagine that's pretty hard because I'd be like, well, it was a nice day, you know, and she was wearing a beautiful dress. Done. So, I mean, like, how hard is that? Well, she would ask me some very good questions so that it would bring out, you know, well, tell us, you know, she would really, you know, ask very detailed questions of me that allowed me to go back and, and share how I felt. So, you know, I was, I think, you know, I was honored to be able to share it in an introduction, but I was more, you know, as I said, I was so grateful to the wonderful genius Bert Bacharach, who shared his words about Aretha in the foreword, and to her beloved niece, Sabrina Vaughn Owens, who shared her beautiful words mm -hmm. in the afterword to the book. And I think, you know, that was really the heart, hearing from Bert Backrack, who had written, I say, say a little prayer and one of Aretha's greatest hits. And the words from Sabrina uh, were so very special and I'm so grateful that they shared them in my book. Right. So, you know, it, it's a book that, you know, is a love letter to Aretha uh, in every possible way. And, you know, having the book published in Detroit is something I know she would have wanted. And Detroit meant everything to her. So the book really shows her love of Detroit, her love of family. Yeah. And, and those were the two most important things. So I, I felt that that's what the book needs to focus on. And, and we did. So let me ask you in this experience, what was the hardest part of making this book? Well, the hardest part I think was just the loss of her. Yeah. You know, I think without question, knowing that I'll never have that experience again. Mm. That's really sad. And that made me very sad because we you know in going back through all of these beautiful times with her, I thought, well, that's over. Yeah. And uh, that's hard. And, but the last photo in the book is one almost of her in silhouette at the piano. Mm -hmm. It's all, and it's very similar to the first photo of her. Because as I mentioned to you, my first photo was of her at the piano. And the last photo that I shared in the book um, was in silhouette, both in Detroit and both, you know, sharing, I feel her heart and her soul. So not to be too maudlin, but, you know, I wonder about the memorial service and you say that, you know, you were there and you were asked to photograph it. Uh, for those of us who weren't in Detroit, 
who came? What was it like? What was, I mean, I remember seeing vis- you know, yeah. TV images of it, but what was it like for you? And well, your- it was uh, an incredible day just to see the Detroiters that were lined up on the streets with signs and, oh my gosh, just to pay their respect. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, the family met at the St. Regis early in the morning, and that was the private uh, reception just for family, no press at all. And then you had everyone from all over the world documenting Greater Grace. So I was at the, the private reception with just the family, and then as we were in the motorcade, I was able to see the fans lined up everywhere. Somehow they knew. The family was at the St. Regis. I don't know how because it was not publicized at all. Right. And yet they were, the fans were lined up all on Grand Boulevard just as we left to go to Greater Grace. And the, during the entire path and, and route, fans were there with signs. And I did use one of the photos in the book. But it was so emotional to see Detroiters paying their respect and their love and then of course all the celebrities that have included mm-hmm. president clinton and and secretary hillary clinton and oh, reverend jesse jackson and isaiah thomas and Smokey robinson and it, it was incredible their love they're sharing their love for the great queen so how would you define this work how would you define this book the queen next door well, as I mentioned, it's, it's a love letter, it's a tribute, and it's a tribute that we will always be able to share with others and future generations, and as I mentioned, her legacy needs to be shared. So that's the most important thing. I mean, sharing the legacy, uh, we've got to do that, yeah. because, you know, this will keep her alive forever, but if we share her music, photographs, beautiful memories of her that we have, you know, just by talking about her. These are the ways to share her forever. And her music will always be there for us to listen and enjoy and love. But it's the personal stories that give us a glimpse into her life because she was so private Mm -hmm. and she was so kind and she was so special. And she was a girlfriend. I mean, she was on Facebook. Do you know that, Tim, she sent me a Facebook request (laughs) and I didn't accept her. Now I'll tell you the reason. She called me and she said, Linda, you didn't accept me on Facebook. I said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, I didn't use my real name. I said, well, so she used the name Kay Cunningham. And after she passed away, I looked back I wanted just, I don't know, just to hold on to her some way, somehow. Yeah. So I went back to her beautiful. Linda? Linda beautiful, yes. One second, I, love- uh, I went back to her Facebook posts and I started reading them. And I realized that, you know, everything stopped at, in 2014, I think, when she became ill. But I, I, I was looking back and reading, and, and Tim, I was so stunned to learn and to realize, I had never, ever realized this, that the great Queen of Soul loved all over the world, had only 22 friends on Facebook. Oh, nice. And I was grateful to be included as one of the 22. That is very touching, extremely touching. So let me ask. Obviously, um, you know, you've taken many, many photographs over the years. Is there another book that you think? uh, (laughs) Well, you know, uh, people have been asking me that. Uh, I have done other books and, you know, that I'm very proud of. But I, this one, I, you know, is my heart. Um, I think, yes. I mean, I've been, you know, working with children for the last 15 years. I work with homeless children. I give them cameras. Yeah. And they capture their hopes and dreams. And the photographs they've taken share the most beautiful life lessons for all of us. They're not dreaming for iPads or material things unless it's a home or a bed or a pair of shoes. Yeah. So I think these powerful photographs taken by children are the photographs I would love to share in a book. 
and to increase awareness for the problem of child homelessness in the United States because many people are not aware the average age of someone homeless in the United States is seven years old. Wow. So in 2.5 million children are homeless. I've been able to bring pictures of hope to 52 cities and these are children that never have an opportunity to share their dreams and they're sharing them in words and in photographs and we print cards with their beautiful photos 100 percent of the proceeds benefit the shelters where they live but their lives have been changed forever we've had scholarships granted when, when children have hoped for a scholarship i've had uh, a, a young woman she was just we just did a webinar together she was granted a full tuition scholarship at the age of nine to her dream college that she photographed for her picture of hope card mm. she said i dream for a scholarship she photographed the exterior of san diego state she was given a scholarship she now has achieved her master's degree we are still very dear friends and she is a psychologist and we met when she was nine her parents that they are now they were homeless they are now ministers in the Salvation Army, and their entire li lives were changed by one photograph because that photograph showed that someone believed in the dreams of their young daughter. The parents never had the opportunity to attend college. She's first generation. And uh, so one photograph can change a life forever. So that would be my next book. And then, of course, the celebrities I've captured through the years i I probably photographed everyone I've ever dreamed of meeting. I've captured the Oscars for 32 consecutive years. So, so there are lots of photographs I'd love to share. Um, you know, during this pandemic, I, I, it's a very difficult time for all of us. I'm not able to photograph anyone. I can't really meet people and talk about my book in person. So this is a wonderful way to share my gratitude to you to have my book selected as one of Michigan's most notable books. That was one of the greatest compliments, one of the most incredible honors for me. I was born here. I have worked my whole life, at, you know, as a photographer, as you know, starting as a child, and now to be respected by my state. I mean, I know you see the Golden Gate Bridge behind me. I don't know how that appeared, but I am devoted to Michigan like Aretha, devoted to Detroit. So to have this incredible honor, when you sent me that email, I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, that was just the most amazing thing to be able to be celebrated with such great authors. I mean, you have selected the greatest authors, you know, my heroes throughout the years. And to be able to visit libraries, that's one of the greatest joys we all can have. You know, my love of a library started as a kid. I would go to the libraries in Detroit and study frogs. I know that sounds crazy, but I had such a passion for frogs yeah, yeah. that my parents would drop me off at the Snow Library and the public libraries where I lived, and I would spend hours reading every book on a frog that I could possibly get my hands on. And this was a way for me to to learn about my passion and my love. I couldn't, you know, we couldn't afford to buy those books, you know, when I was a child. So to be able to go to the library and study my passion as a child, and, and then they would take me to, to other libraries so that I could find more books about frogs. So my parents would just spend hours with me at the Detroit Public Library. So to be able to, you know, to have this honor Tim, this is everything, you know, to me, um, because of the library is, a, is my safe harbor. And, you know, and then as I continue to grow and nurture my love of the library, when I was in high school and junior high, I, I would go to the library and just sit there for hours and learn how to use a card catalog and, and study the things that I loved and also study what I needed to study. <laughs> Maybe I didn't right. love it so much, but, but at least I had the resources by going to the library. So, so that's why this honor, you know, it is just, it, it's, it's just huge for someone like me. And, you know, and that's why I, I was so upset that I couldn't go to libraries and share Aretha you know, during this pandemic. And hopefully when things become normal again, 
I'll be able to visit with the libraries and meet people and, and just share our stories. And, and like I said earlier, I want to hear everyone else's love for Aretha. And that's what the library visits are all about. It's that connection, yeah. being able to share with a community our love for the Queen of Soul. So hopefully we'll be able to do that once everything changes back. <laughs> I have to say the libraries that were chosen for you were definitely excited. I know that for you to come. Yes, and share yes. Your and I was too. And I, and I, and that is a great tragedy, but also this ability to talk to each other via, uh, you know, video is, is just an amazing thing. And, and we wouldn't have done it without this tragedy. I guess my question for you finally is, why do you think someone should read this work? Why should they look at the queen next door? <laughs> well, I think, as I said earlier, it will give you a glimpse into the way she really lived her life. Mm -hmm. So many people just see a star on stage or just listen to a star. But this is an opportunity for, for you to really get to know her and to see her heart. Um, that's what it's all about. You know, as a journalist, it's revealing the heart. And I hope I've done that. And, and um, that was my mission. And, and again, it's just sharing my respect for her. And I think, you know, she is just, she's, you know, I think, I think Barry Gordy said it best. He said, some stars come along every 10 years. Some stars come along every 20 years. And some stars come along just once. And that's Aretha. Very nice. Very nice. And thank you, Linda. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you thank for sharing you. your thoughts and, and your heart with us. And to all of you, The Queen Next Door, Wayne State University Press by Linda Solomon. This, again, is thank the you. great book uh, tour, uh, virtual. And if you are looking to support Michigan Notable Books, please contact the Library of Michigan Foundation, where contact information can be found at the beginning and ending of this episode. Thank you so much for being with us. And Linda, thank you for being thank with you, us. Thank you, Tim. Thank Stay you. safe. Stay you happy. Too.